Hello everyone, this is the CircuitPython weekly meeting for August 17th, 2020. It's the time of the week where we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. Uh, we had some computer trouble earlier, so uh, we've already done the intro for people in the meeting, so I'm just going to breeze through this for those who are listening in. Um, this meeting is recorded and will be posted to YouTube and also released on various podcast services. If you find this podcast is not available on your favorite podcast service, let us know. Um, let's see. I'm Jeff Hepler, and I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython. CircuitPython is a version of Python designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. Development of CircuitPython is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so support us by purchasing hardware from Adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. This meeting is accompanied by a notes document. The document is updated with time codes so that if you want to watch or listen to just a part of the meeting after the fact, you can skip to what you're interested in. Uh, with that, I will take a time code and we will continue on to community news. All right. In community news, Visual Studio Code now supports Raspberry Pi and ARM Chromebooks. Visual Studio Code is one of the most popular pieces of programming software on the planet, in part because it is available on any platform a developer might want to use it on, at least mostly. One missing piece was ARM support for Linux devices, but with the latest release that's been rectified. This has huge applications in making and education. And uh, Foamy Guy is kindly dropping notes in, or dropping links in the chat if you want to check out more about that. Uh, there is also a Cutie Pie Circuit Python Tricks. Cutie Pie Tricks is a collection of projects for using the Adafruit Cutie Pie mini board running Circuit Python 6. The code will also work on a Tracket M0 and other Circuit Python compatible boards with an adjustment to the pin assignments. Today is Ada Lovelace Day. The world celebrates Ada Lovelace Day on the second Tuesday of October. Instead of lamenting all the in-person gatherings and Halloween hoedowns that aren't happening this year, get into the virtual activities coming your way. Today, Adafruit is spending the day highlighting a number of women who are pioneers in their fields and inspiring women of all ages to make their voices heard. Finding Ada has some ways you can get involved and spread the word, and follow those links for more. SparkFun has a survey. Uh, from the SparkFun banner, please take our customer survey for a chance to win $500 in SparkFun credit. We really appreciate the time you take to give us your extremely valuable feedback on how SparkFun can be its best. We couldn't do it without your input. Thank you. This is a chance to ask for more Feather and CircuitPython things from SparkFun. And uh, thanks for the links, Foamy Guy. There's the link to the uh, survey. And at the end, if, you, if it turns out like mine, you also get a 10% coupon. Uh, an update on Adafruit. Adafruit carries all the technology to make Halloween fantastic. See projects tagged electric, Electronic Halloween all month for Halloween-related projects using Adafruit gear. Adafruit is stocked in shipping orders. Now is the best time to get in orders for your favorite products, including items for students. Science is fun and educational when using the Adaparts and free, easy-to-follow tutorials in the Adafruit learning system. The uh, CircuitPython and Python on Hardware newsletter is driven by people like you in the community. So, um, and it's emailed every Tuesday. It highlights CircuitPython related news from around the web. Um, well, is that my keyboard? Well, somebody, maybe me, just inserted a bunch of new lines. That's fun. To contribute, you can edit next week's draft on GitHub and submit a pull request with the changes. You can also mention an engineer on uh, Twitter and tag your post with CircuitPython. And uh, with that, we will move on to the next section of the meeting called The State of CircuitPython, The Libraries, and Blinka. Uh, primarily, this section is a statistical overview of uh, what is going on with the project, although we'll also hear a bit of narrative from some of the people involved. 
So uh, overall, within the last uh, seven days, we had 26 pull requests merged by 19 authors. Some of the names that are unfamiliar to me are Kevin AJ, I think Kevin has been around, Unid, ETEQ, H Nomi, 2231 Puppy. Uh, we had another contributor who was on yesterday's list. Uh, since today's meeting is a day late, the seven day list will miss people. And I spotted that uh, user S Warren was on yesterday's list, but not today. And that brings us to actually 20 authors in the last eight days, which is really amazing. We had 11 reviewers, uh, including a new face, Gambler21. I'm sure you've seen him around Discord and uh, on Show and Tell, but he has kindly agreed to become an official reviewer of uh, PRs for the CircuitPython project. So thank you very much for that. Um, let's see, issues wise, we had 13 closed issues by four people and 13 opened by 10 people. So we're net even on issues and we're seeing a lot of uh, participation uh, just by reporting issues and bugs from 10 additional people in the community. So thanks for that. And uh, as we discussed last week, we are doing some participation in Hacktoberfest. And so we added the Hacktoberfest label to 27 issues. Uh, so overall, as I mentioned, we're, we're just having a great number of authors and contributors and reviewers and we've been making a great deal of progress towards being able to release a version 6 release candidate. And a lot of that is due to Scott's activity, both on the bug fixing side and the reviews side. And of course, a lot of the other uh, people are also contributing to that. So I don't think we've set, I mean, we don't work based on dates. We work based on milestones. So I don't know exactly when that release candidate is going to happen, but I really feel that it's pretty soon because we're getting to a very small number of issues. And with that, I will continue on and speak specifically about the core. The core is the part of CircuitPython that is written in C, and it's the basis that makes everything else work. And um, so the it's kind of an arbitrary division, but um, anyway, we had, uh, of those 26 pull requests, eight of them were merged within the core by eight authors. So we have UNID again. Uh, we have translation updates from W. Tamura and Hex that. I believe that was what their contribution was. And we had just two reviewers, myself and Scott. The number of pull requests open is 20. And about half of those uh, have been open uh, less than two weeks and half of them more than two weeks. So it's just kind of a split between things that um, are coming in at a, at a pretty fast rate or things that are open because they need more review or just because it's not the right uh, moment to merge them. But we definitely uh, need to go back and look at those at some point. And uh, surprisingly, we only had one closed issue by one person, um, according to this summary. I'm not sure whether that's accurate. Of the Hacktoberfest labels, the core has 18 of them, and our total number of open issues is 324. We prefer to track our issues by milestone. So for instance, for the 600 milestone, we have only four open issues. And uh, once that list uh, is pared down to zero issues, I think that's when we can go ahead and make a release candidate. Uh, we've also got four feature requests and 13 bug fixes all of which we would like to address during the life cycle of 6.0. And then after that, we can start thinking beyond to version seven, which already has three issues assigned to it. And um, let's see, I think that's all I have to say about the course. So I will pass to Katni to tell us about the libraries. Thanks, Jeff. You're welcome. So this is information that is across all CircuitPython libraries. So every library that is Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore library name. We had 15 pull requests merged by eight authors, including some of the new names you mentioned earlier, and 10 reviewers, including our new reviewer as well. Uh, the oldest merged pull request was 163 days. That's really excellent to see that we're keeping up with some of the older PRs and the rest of them were 10 days or less, most of them being uh, one or zero days open before being merged. Um, we had, I, and I do want to point out, we had an addition to the community bundle 
which is included in this. Uh, so that's excellent to see. Um, we always love to see community libraries getting added to that. We had nine closed issues by four people and 12 opened by nine people, leaving us with 212 open issues. We also have 30 open pull requests. Uh, again, the oldest one of those is still slowly being worked on, so we are um, continuing to work with that author. We assigned the Hacktoberfest label to nine issues, uh, which lines up with the fact that we have nine good first issues. Uh, that's the tag that causes the Hacktoberfest label to be added. Um, if you are interested in all of this or interested in contributing to the CircuitPython project, but maybe not ready to, to contribute to the core, you can check out circuitpython.org slash contributing. And what you'll find there is uh, all of this information, um, a list of open PRs, a list of open issues, and some library infrastructure issues. Um, you can search the issues page for good first issues if that's your level of, of skill or that's your level of comfort. Um, or you can search it for bug or enhancement if you're looking for something more complicated. We have a guide on using Git and GitHub with uh, to contribute to CircuitPython. So we can definitely um, help you out there. And if uh, you have any questions beyond that, you can always ask us. We're always available on Discord. Um, we want you to be able to contribute. So don't let the fact that we work on uh, GitHub and use Git uh, intimidate you. Um, we can always help you get started with that. Uh, and in the last seven days, we had one new library, uh, the TLA202X, and a short list of updated libraries that I will not read off. Um, and that's it for the libraries. All right. I just want to add one thing to that. Um, working with Git is um, sometimes, well, often beginners have questions. And we recently added a help with Git channel here on the Adafruit Discord. Yes, so. We you know, if you're running into trouble with Git and it's related to CircuitPython, we're happy to have you ask it in the CircuitPython channel or the help with CircuitPython channel. Uh, but if it goes beyond kind of one-liners, we'll probably move that over to help with Git and uh, maybe get some more in-depth help and assistance. And I'm happy to see that channel uh, begin to exist. And um, yeah, we're, we're here to help you out and get you through those uh, roadblocks or speed bumps that you encounter on the way to contributing to CircuitPython. And uh, with that, I believe I'm handing it back to you, Katni, to tell us about Blinka. Yeah, so I'm uh, sitting in for Melissa today. Blinka is our uh, compatibility layer for using CircuitPython with uh, single board computers such as Raspberry Pi. We had three pull requests merged by three authors and one reviewer. There, were two op there are two open pull requests right now. Um, we had three closed issues by one people and one, <laughs> one person, and one opened by one person, uh, leaving a net of 26 open issues. Um, you can view that at github.com slash Adafruit slash Adafruit underscore Blinka slash issues. Um, there were uh, 1,980 PyPI downloads of the Adafruit Blinka library in the last week, and the current number of supported boards is 52. Thank you. And with that, we will move on to our first round robin section called Hug Reports. If you've seen someone in the community here on Discord, on online forums, on GitHub, who has done something good, please take a moment to spotlight what they're doing and uh, kind of form an antidote to the negativity that a lot of uh, forums that aren't well run encounter. So I will uh, start off and then we'll continue down in alphabetical order. Uh, Jerry will come next, and then when we get to the end of the alphabet, we'll go back to the beginning and get uh, everybody. And if I miss you for some reason, please just uh, speak up within the text channel, and then I will call on you. So uh, first of all, I want to start with a group hug, because like I was saying to Scott before the meeting, there's just this, um, this amazing community around me, and I know I'm going to forget to thank somebody. Uh, but I particularly want to thank GitHub user C. Walther for continuing his work on some core improvements that I am uh, interested in seeing. And they're going to enable some better memory usage and enable some interesting features when you need to restart your Python program. Um, and we've been kind of working on the pull request, and I think that's about ready to go in. Uh, so uh, Jerry is up next and followed by Katni. Hello, uh, just a big group hug this week. All right, thank you. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, following uh, Katni, I have some notes from various people, uh, but go ahead, Katni. 
All right. So first and foremost, um, thanks to Dan for help, quote unquote, uh, which is to say it was mostly him. Um, with writing up a simple version of an explanation for why time.monotonic loses precision over time, uh, I added a frequently asked questions page to the LED animations guide. And one of the things that happens is with non-express M0 boards, the animations do slow down uh, over time because of the loss of precision of time.monotonic. Um, and so I wanted to add an, an FAQ about that, but explaining that uh, very technical concept in a very simple way was um, quite difficult and took a lot of iterations. And Dan was super patient and helped me a lot with it. And now we have an excellent explanation. Uh, to Mark Gambler for joining the CircuitPython librarians review team and for reviewing two PRs for me. Um, that's always amazing to see new reviewers. Uh, he was commenting on PRs um, to review them already. So we went ahead and added him to the review team and now he's official. Uh, and thanks to you, Jeff, for a much needed chat. It is always a pleasure. All right, uh, so I have notes from Maker Melissa and then we will go to Scott. And uh, Maker Melissa just sends a group hug. After Scott, we will go back up to the beginning of the alphabet for uh, some notes from C. Grover. Go ahead, Scott. All right, thank you. Uh, first off, a hug report to Caps Lock for taking on adding transparency to color converter. Yes. Uh, it's very close. Uh, we have one build that is out of space, unfortunately. Uh, so we'll take a look at that and figure it out. Um, we can always find some room. Uh, huge hug report as well to Warrior of Wire. Uh, we merged in enabling async IO, um, which is actually a huge deal. Um, I don't think we're going to tell or teach people how to use it, but it's uh, now on by default, which means uh, folks who do know it, like Warrior Wire, can build on top of it, which is very cool. Um, it, I should also note that it's the older version of Async IO. It's not the one that uh, MicroPython currently has, uh, but Warrior Wire has done a really good job of making it work more like CPython, which is really awesome. Um, so thanks again to Warrior Wire. Um, thanks to Sparkpeng for diving into building CircuitPython to add display IO to the non Hackspress. Um, a lot of people have been picking up the cutie pie and wanting display IO. So they, they were like, oh, I could just like hack around it and figure out how to get the, the things turned on off and on. Um, so that was really cool. Uh, Deshipu, thank you for helping folks out on the discord, uh, always catching up and it's really great to see you taking, uh, taking time to help folks. Uh, thank you to C. Walter for uh, taking on moving the memory off the heap uh, after the VM stops. Uh, it's like one of those core things. So it was really cool to see them kind of taking on that higher level supervisor level stuff. So thanks to them. And lastly, a hug to Katni for leveling up other folks like Mark. Um, it's something I was good at originally and am now quite bad at. So it's great to have Katni uh, pick up the slack and really level folks up. It's been really awesome to see. Thanks. And that's it for me. All right. I have notes from C. Grover and then a few more notes. And the next uh, person besides me up is Foamy Guy. Uh, but C. Grover sends a hug report to Brent for awesome AIO learning guides and some recent help with sticky requests library issue that was hampering my AIO learning indoctrination process. Do you think sometimes people write things just to make it like a tongue twister for the uh, moderator? I don't know. Anyway, next I have notes from uh, David, who has a hug report for Toddbot for the cutie pie tricks, to Dan H for all the BLE stuff, hope you get better soon, to Maker Melissa for the Matrix Portal Guide, and to Katni for the cutie pie guide. All right, and Foamy Guy, I guess you get to finish up this round of hug reports. All right, thanks, Jeff. Uh, this week, I would like to give out a hug to uh, user 2231 Puppy. Over, I think it was over the weekend or Friday, maybe they were in the chat room. They were asking if there was a Discord library for CircuitPython, uh, which there is not, uh, to the best of my knowledge. But they went ahead and um, got one spun up, and uh, you know learned about Git and everything, and actually got it added to the community bundle already. So that was really cool to see. Uh, you know somebody step up and 
build a brand new thing there and then share it with all of us. Uh, so big thanks to that's a two, two, three, one puppy um, to caps lock uh, again for the, you know, the ability, I think the, the idea is to get transparency with the on disk bitmaps. If I understand correctly, that's a really cool prospect. Uh, so really excited about that work as well to Brent uh, for a great suggestion on a potential new uh, Pi portal library example to uh, Warrior of Wire, uh, again, for the async and await APIs uh, that Scott was talking about. I'm very excited to try those out. I have a bunch to learn about it, um, but definitely looks very interesting. And then uh, lastly, to Unexpected Maker and Scott and anybody else who was involved in getting that help with Git channel um, set up on Discord. I really like to see that uh, come along. Yes, thanks. Um, so our, that wraps it up for Hug Reports. And we will move on to status updates. Status updates is a time to let us know what you've been up to since the last meeting and uh, what you hope to accomplish before the next meeting. So typically, you'll cover about one week looking back and one week looking forward. And again, it's done in a round robin. And I will start things off. And then uh, next, we will go to Jerry. So last week, I reviewed and approved PRs after a gentle reminder from Scott to do it. Thank you. Uh, including some translations from WebLate. And it's really nice. Uh, pardon me a moment. <coughs> it's really nice every time to see those translations coming in. Uh, WebLate was a good choice. Uh, anyway, I'm working on improving the parallelization of the build, which means that people with powerful desktop computers can do builds faster. Some parts of that have merged, and some parts have not yet been merged. I did an update to the Protomatter library, which powers the RGB matrix. Um, that didn't bring in any new features, but it makes sure that we're ready for a future release of Protomatter that will bring in some exciting new features that are being worked on. And I also worked on CAN support for Arduino, which is, of course, not CircuitPython, except that I'm making sure it interoperates with CircuitPython, and that is kind of my reference implementation as I work on this other thing. So this week, uh, hopefully wrapping up Arduino CAN. If I do finish that, uh, I'm returning to a learn guide about a calculator project that I did. And then soon, this is less likely to be this week, um, I will be implementing CAN in CircuitPython for the ESP32-S2. Uh, Jerry is up next, and then Katni. You ready, Jerry? Yeah, if I can just find the unmute button. There it is. Jeff, why is it called Protomatter? Um, so that's just what the author called it. It was a reference to the um, technology used in the Genesis device in Star Trek II. OK. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> Glad it wasn't supposed to be obvious. All right. Um, it, so, no, it's a little uh, bit of an inside joke. <laughs> uh, I, I, I really had nothing to report, but I did a, a question because um, I saw in Scott's notes he's you know, coming up on a release. And there's, there's one issue that, that I ran into with the ESP32 S2 that SSL certificates, or at least some of them aren't working. And there's a note in, in the issue you know, that they need to be updated probably to, be, to make them um, up to the same level that the Nina firmware is. So it's this question is if somebody can give me a pointer if it's something that you know a mere mortal can tackle, I'd be happy to try it. I just I tried looking in the code and I didn't see any place where it would be done. So if, uh, if somebody really wants to steer me, I'd be happy to take a look at it. Otherwise, it can wait. I just want to make sure it's not holding anything up. Scott, do you want to answer that real quick, or do you want to take it down to in the weeds? So I would just say, I don't want to hold up the 6.0 release on anything ESP32 S2 related um, because I want it, people to think it's still beta for the S2. Um, I don't know exactly how to do it, but I can give you a lead and I just have to find the URL for it. Okay, take your time. I'm going to have to leave the meeting pretty soon. So just you know, send me a note um, and I'll, I'll take a look at it and see if I can you know, figure it out. But uh, okay. my, my first attempts <laughs> didn't get me anywhere. So, all right. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, I don't know exactly how to do it, but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll follow up on the issue for you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, on deck, I have some notes from Maker Melissa, but now uh, it's Katni. 
All right. All right. <clears throat> so last week, yesterday, and earlier today, I can't remember where I left off last week, so some of this may be duplicated. Added the circuit Python page to the SH1107 uh, Featherwing OLED, I want to say, um, guide. We didn't initially have uh, support for that, but a community member contributed um, CircuitPython support for that. And so I added a CircuitPython page to the guide, which only had Arduino to begin with. Um, I made a fritzing object for the Metro ESP32-S2, which is upcoming. I soldered up a Cutie Pie Hack Express, which is a huge deal because I've never soldered tiny parts before. And um, not only did it come out uh, working, it actually looked really good. Um, so I kind of got you know double bonuses on that. Um, no idea if I could replicate it. I do have another pair here that I will eventually try to replicate it with, but um, I uh, we'll, we'll find out whether it's something I can actually do again. Uh, started a Cutie Pie and NeoPixels guide for both the base Cutie Pie and the Cutie Pie Hack Express. Added a FAQ to the CircuitPython LED animations guide. There were two major things about SAMD21 uh, and SAMD21 um, non-express boards. Uh, don't run it. Um, and the express boards will only run um, all but two of the animations. So uh, we wanted to, I wanted to add a you know an FAQ so that people knew what they were getting into if they're trying to you know do Circuit Python LED animation library stuff with the uh, Circuit Playground Express, for example. And I added Mark Gambler to the CircuitPython librarians team. This week, I'll be finishing up the Cutie Pie NeoPixels guide. It's basically written, but just needs images, videos, or GIFs. Um, I need to think of a few possibly simple Cutie Pie projects to do, have at least one um, in mind, but got to come up with a couple others uh, to choose from, and then we'll be doing at least one guide, I assume, there. Probably write up a one-page guide on the new VS Code for Raspberry Pi and Chromebook. Um, and there's a whole list of fritzing objects that need to be created, um, but those are low priority. So if something else comes up, it may go in front of that. But my first priority is finishing up the Cutie Pie and NeoPixels guide. And that's where I'm at. Thank you. Uh, Scott is on deck, but first I have notes from Maker Melissa. Uh, Maker Melissa last week finished up writing the BrainCraft hat guide updated the machine learning Raspberry Pi TensorFlow guide with the latest updates, updated the PyTFT easy install page with the latest information, including running the rewritten Python script, worked on improving and optimizing a scoreboard demo for JP's workshop, did a sweep of the existing PyPortal issues, dug into some incompatible changes with requests and PyPortal, but didn't get very far, and started work on a new BrainCraft Google Assistant guide. This week, uh, we'll work on finishing up the BrainCraft Google Assistant guide, test out some more obscure matrix portal library configurations, and test out an issue with the SSD 1351 on Arduino. And as far as other stuff, she worked on hacking a keyboard to implement MIDI. Uh, she got as far as successfully detecting all key presses and releases, ended up going the Arduino route due to 5 volt logic used in the keyboard and not wanting to complicate things with logic level shifters. Uh, so after Scott, I have text from C. Grover. Go ahead, Scott. Hello. Okay, uh, longest ago, I finished up the IMXRT work, um, and it's merged in. Uh, basically, we were having issues with flash config being different across boards, so now it's unified, and the configs also set the quad enable bit on startup, uh, which... It's this weird thing where it's like if it's a brand new fresh board and the spy flash doesn't have quad enable set but we try to use it that way it causes an error so now uh, setting it every startup means that we ensure that it's always set which is good um after that i moved on to 6.0 issues i've knocked out a few of them um and in fact i think we're actually down to zero once the last one is merged in i just had one quick change to do on it um, so issues I fixed were SAMD21's auto reload was broken due to sleep over overriding the tick timeout. Uh, so I fixed that. Um, on the 21 as well, I fixed a timing problem that led to the Pew library flickering. Uh, basically, we were turning off interrupts for a surprisingly long period of time. 
uh, which should actually mean that we're more performant, I think, as well, uh, which will be good. Uh, and then on the STM side, I fixed an issue with I squared C timeouts um, that was caused by the clock going backwards, which is never a good thing for a clock that's always supposed to go uh, forwards. Um, and the, the fundamental problem there was we were reading the, the RTC is three separate registers that you all need to read, and you have to make sure that you get them all kind of like in sync with each other. Otherwise, like one might be ahead of the other ones that you read. So uh, I got that fixed as well. Um, I do want to do a release candidate this week, unless somebody has a, a super urgent issue they think should block it. Um, I think it's also important to note that a release candidate does not mean that there aren't issues. It just means there are not issues we're aware of. Basically, the way that it works is that uh, it could be a stable release. Uh, so we basically release it as a release candidate. We let people use it for like a week. And if anything major comes up, we do another release candidate. If nothing major comes up, we just literally take that release and call it the stable one. Uh, and then we're on the stable release, which would be really cool. So that's kind of the gist uh, about release candidate. And we can talk about it more a bit later. Uh, next up for me is the Deep Sleep API. I know I've been saying I'm going to do this, and I feel bad because Microdev really got it started. But um, this week, for real, I'm going to I'm going to do all the API work for it, uh, and then hopefully Microdev and I can tag team it for the S2, uh, which will be really cool. It'll allow you to actually like put everything and shut everything, almost everything down, and, and really save some battery, which will be neat. All right. Um, so Dan is on deck. I have notes from C. Grover, who says, learning, learning, learning. The LoRa slash Arduino based workshop corrosion monitor is now nearly all CircuitPython and AIO. Proof of concept was proved, so now it's time to order those expensive indoor and outdoor sensors. Still need to noodle a more reliable algorithm for predicting future corrosion potential. In the design phase for two new Eurorack modules, front panels, physical UI, and most CircuitPython code modules are good to go. Just need to work out some pesky hardware issues. Predominantly, how much stuff can be jammed into a 10 HP module? Also designing a DC motor characterization workbench to study low-speed torque control for a couple of robot projects. We'll be testing a dynamometer scheme as soon as strain gauges and companion Wheatstone bridge arrive. We'll take a shot at converting the 24-bit I squared C Wheatstone ADC Arduino library code to CircuitPython. Oh, and we'll need to pick up some additional 2020 extrusion to mount the torque computer, converter and test motor. Love working with these adult erector set components. Uh, so up uh, soon is notes from David Gloud, but now we're ready to hear from Dan. Hi, Dan. Hello. Sorry I missed the earlier meeting. I was <clears throat> on the phone. Um, so I'm starting to work again after my bike accident. I've got a split keyboard, which is working great to compensate for my broken elbow. And it's, I'm not in pain when I'm typing. It's a little bit of a nuisance to mouse with my left hand, but otherwise things are working out well. Um, I'm working on, um, making sure that Blinka BLAIO is, um, in good shape. It's actually really peculiar. It's working on some versions of Raspberry Pi and not others. And I don't understand that. And uh, trying to track that down. I have five Raspberry Pis on the desk right now and I keep swapping the same SD card between them. And it's very odd. So the point of this is that I'm writing a guide for how to use Blinka BLEIO on various host computers, including Raspberry Pi, but I have to get make sure that it works on everything before I, I, I finish that guide. So that's what I'm working on right now. OK. All right. Uh, Foamy Guy is on deck, but first notes from David. Uh, soldering the Cutie Pie Hack Express. Somebody should put an extra warning to say that Cutie Pie is small and the thing you solder is even smaller, as well as the Matrix Portal M4 for 64 by 64, although he may have destroyed a pad by trying to use solder wick to reduce the blob size. Test and repair is in progress. Uh, also improving a Corona app detector on Circuit Playground Blue Fruit. I should be ready for my first show and tell or learn guide. And there's a link there. I don't know if you can get that for me, guy. 
and a cutie pie trick of the week based on a Todd bot idea, a keyboard prank that removes caps lock and others when you try to press it, also with a uh, GitHub link. So with that, we will let Foamy Guy wrap up status updates. All right, thank you, Jeff. Uh, let's get here. Okay, this week, uh, or last week rather, um, the, I was working on a multitasking guide for CircuitPython that got published. Um, tested up a few PRs for the PyPortal library, and one also I think you mentioned about updating Protomatter in the core. Uh, I made a little bit of progress on the mobile phone app for uh, my Bluetooth smart charger so the phone can tell the charger when it's full so that it can stop charging. I was able to successfully see messages my phone is sending uh, from the Itsy Bitsy. So my phone is sending them, the Itsy Bitsy is receiving them, and I got the communication working. Now I just need to actually build the logic to uh, send the right things when the battery is at the right levels and actually get it all wired up to do what I want it to do now. Uh, next week, I would like to explore the possibility of using a SAMD21 as, I guess, like a USB host pass-through for a keyboard. I have, I bought uh, this neat uh, Kinesis keyboard. It's actually a split keyboard like Dan was mentioning. Um, and uh, there's a weird quirk in the driver on my specific computer, because, uh, of course, there must be. Um, and so it, it doesn't work for me right now. I'm hoping to, to trick the computer into not realizing uh, what it is so that I can use it. Uh, and then the other thing I really want to work on next week, the last thing is... Uh, I got a monster mask the other day, so I want to set up uh, some of the Halloween stuff. I want to try to get monster eyes or something similar like that going on the on the mask. Um, and that's what I got for next week. All right. Thank you, everybody. And with that, we will move on to the last section of the meeting called In the Weeds. This is the time for long-form discussion and um, anything that doesn't fit within the other sections of the meeting. We'll just go in the order that things have been added to the section, and I will hand it off to the person who wants to lead the discussion. And so we will begin with Scott, who has some stuff to say about the Microbit version 2. All right, so if you haven't seen it yet, the Microbit, Microbit V2 was announced overnight uh, for those of us in the Pacific time zone. Um, if you, The details are that it's the NRF52833 which is basically a slimmed down version of the 840, which we use a lot. Um, unfortunately, I believe that the native USB is not connected up. So it means that we can't have the like CircuitPy drive sort of model with it, which is so, so, so unfortunate. But I would love to, I, I just want to pitch this idea again of uh, having a CircuitPython workflow over BLE. Um, so if anybody is interested in working on like the, core workflow for how do you pair a device with a CircuitPython BLE device and then create uh, an app and protocol to be able to load and push changes uh, to the Python code on the device from like a mobile phone or uh, some other remote device. Uh, please ping me if you're interested in that. Um, I think it's really cool. It's just like one of those things is like very long term and very like R&D sorts of things. Uh, but I think that's what we would need to basically to truly bring CircuitPython to the Microbit V2. Um, yeah, so that's all I have to say about that, unless other folks want to chime in. And if not, I will hand it right back to you to uh, <laughs> talk about Release Candidate. Uh, perfect. So I just wanted to say, is anybody wary of me doing a Release Candidate, maybe even like later today? Um, I think there's one more PR from me uh, to fix the RTC stuff. Uh, but besides that, I think we're kind of set for re release candidate. Uh, I definitely want to also branch it off the main um, the main branch as well so that uh, anything else coming into main doesn't impact the stable release. The only thing that I know about is this um, supervisor heap work. I think it would be really nice to have that, if not in 6.0, then in 6.1, because mm -hmm. the other benefit we're going to be able to derive from that is for the RGB matrix displays. Right now, uh, when you do a soft reset, the display remains active, and you have to release the display and create a new one. And right. that means that we, and because of the way supervisor allocations work, we can't reuse that memory from the display that was just released. We have to mm -hmm. allocate fresh memory. 
And right. with these changes, we are going to gain the ability to reuse that memory. And that can be, I think, well in excess of, um, in, an, in another meeting, I think I said 12 kilobytes, like for the 32 mm -hmm. by 64 matrix. I think it's higher than that because it's the frame buffer for the matrix itself, plus all of this pre-digested data, one, one set of bit planes for each bit of depth. So it can add up to quite a bit. Mm -hmm. It'd be really nice right. to get that in, but I feel like that's not a nothing to hold 604 it might mm -hmm. be something to get into 61 uh yeah i mean i think that's yeah I, I i think it's unless it's gonna land in the next few days i think it's fair to just do it later uh -huh. um but you know it there's getting 60 out the door doesn't mean that we can't be aggressive about getting subsequent releases after that. Right. And this is um, in, in many ways a, a bug fix. It's not an incompatibility or something that we can't do um, right. between minor versions, but it's, it's something that would be really yeah. nice to have, but it's a potential destabilizer just because it's working at a very low level. Um, yeah, I don't think we should wait for it, but we should definitely like, if I, I you're not doing that work, right? Like C. Walter is doing that work? He, ha yeah, the PR to change how the allocator works is his and it's almost done. But okay. then it's necessary to go back and change uh, in the RGB matrix and in the sharp matrix how they uh -huh. allocate memory because the way I wrote them, I tried first to allocate heat memory and second to allocate uh, supervisor right. memory and that, that, that just needs to have the logic reversed. Right. Um, yeah, I think, I think we should just get 6.0 out the door. I think generally, like, do we really want people using 5.3.1 still is the right. real question. No, we don't. And uh -huh. yeah, as long as you see that as uh, able to go in at a, at a minor release, you know, a, a 6.0.1 or a 6.1.0, then I'm perfectly comfortable with that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm totally, I'm totally okay with that. I think what we found is that like, once we have a 6.0 stable, it's pretty quick to do releases after that, um, assuming that no nothing super major changes. Um, we're just kind of in this state where it's been a while, like three months or something, since we've done a stable release. So there's like, you want to be a little bit more cautious with it. Um, so yeah, I would like I would like to us to be releasing stable releases more often. For so sure. I, I don't think it will block it. So we are pretty much good to go though on like any blocking issues we've we've caught up with those. Yeah, so if we look at the 60 milestone, I think there's one remaining. Okay. And the PR was it was approved and tested overnight. Mm -hmm. Um but I changed one thing that Dave said he had changed when he tested it mm -hmm. and then pushing that commit dismiss those reviews so uh we'll just need the re the reviews to approve again and then we can merge it and that is our i think that's our that closes our last issue marked as 6 all right uh, if i don't do that question? within an hour after the meeting ping me and i'll get to that review okay where even are the milestones now uh i don't know what you mean on github to view them. So there's like, this stuff that looks like it's the like the column headers of the list of issues, and one of them should say milestones. Click it and choose the milestone. Ah, okay, I was in the wrong tab. Okay, yeah, gotcha. All right. I think you can also, if you see the milestone on a bug in that list, you can click it. Yeah, and... I think so too. Okay. But right, when... so we've got we've got two, and you're working on one or both, I assume, because I so think. If you see the milestone and you see two things, that's actually both a PR and an issue. Ah, that makes sense so, because I saw them. I saw the comment earlier that one of them fixed the other, so that makes more sense. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So if you if you're looking at issues and select the drop down and then select six, you'll get one result, which is just the issue with that milestone. Excellent. But if you look at the milestone itself, you'll see both the PR that fixes the issue and the issue itself. All right. Sorry. Learning. Um, no problem. It's confusing. Yeah, no, I think I think it's fine. Um, and I agree with you. Like, we need to leverage point releases more than we do. Um, cool. Just in the sense that, like, we 
we have a tendency to try, or we have had anyway, a tendency to try and cram everything into a major release. Um, and it stretches out how long it takes us to do major releases. And if we want to be doing them more regularly, I think we need to leverage the point releases um, mm -hmm. so we can get, you know, smaller stuff in and, and be able to continually be, you know, updating CircuitPython in general. So yeah. that's my thoughts. Which I think we did better with 5.3 until we started believing 6.0 was just around the corner. And that's what led us <laughs> to have this uh, time gap. Yeah. Uh, well, I and, also... Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I also think I don't see, we don't have like a bunch of imminent stuff for seven necessarily. Right. So it's not, we don't have some big major goal, big API rework or something. So I think we may be on six a little longer than some of the other. I think the thing that's going to cause us to go to seven is going to be updating MicroPython. Right. If that's right. If that's right. That's my, that's a good point. That's on my next agenda which yeah, i think it's... is going to be people are going to want more with the async stuff that warrior wire just turned on mm -hmm. i think we're going to hear people be like oh async is great but why isn't it whatever micropython did uh, so i think that's going to be the gap before seven but i think there's enough like i would kind of like to iterate on six on like do six one six two six three to get the S2 out of beta, exactly, just like David's saying. Mm -hmm. um, I think the answer to your question is you're good to go for release candidate. All right. Yeah, so I'll get that last PR in and close that last issue, and then we'll do a release candidate. All right. Uh, then we have our next item, which is from Katni. Yeah, so I wanted to see where we were with Oktoberfest. I know, uh, Scott, you were going to opt in the entire um, CircuitPython repo and see how that went. Mm -hmm. um, is it going all right? <laughs> it's. I, I haven't noticed anything. I, I added the topic, but... And... Okay, so you haven't gotten a bunch of, of spam stuff. No. Nope. was the concern. No. Nope. Excellent. Um, and I've gotten my four. <laughs> I got my four PRs, so it's definitely adding them or counting the, the PRs yeah, yeah. as well. Um, so I had a couple thoughts um, just after dealing with getting my own four, mm -hmm. which is that I feel like we could put some more effort into promoting that we're participating. Okay. Um, I don't know how to do that. That's It's just I'm, I'm throwing stuff out here. Mm -hmm. um, and then put the onus on the PR authors to let us know that they're participating so that we're not running right. around trying to say like, Oh, we've got like, you know, 36 open PRs across the libraries. Like we need to go check all of them and make sure that, you know, they all have that label. Um, mm -hmm. I think it would make a lot more sense for, you know, an author to just let us know, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm participating in Hacktoberfest, you know, does this qualify or something to that effect? And then we can right. add the label as we go. Um, Cause I don't know um, whether, other members of our team signed up as maintainers or not. Mm -hmm. um, I have no problem doing that uh, as long as it's happening within uh, Monday through Wednesday. Right. Um, so I have no problem keeping up with that. But I think I don't. I don't think the workload's going to be very large. Um, yeah. But I think it would be best if we sort of put that on the author to let us know that they're participating, and then we can follow up with adding the label. Yeah, I agree. That's kind of what I expect is like folks who listen to this or participate in this meeting, if you want to participate in Hacktoberfest and just need us to okay the, the PRs, please let us know. Okay. I like Excellent. I like it as a tool to help you level people up, right? Like, yeah, exactly. Um, and it gives us an opportunity too, to interact with, with an author, um, even if it's on a very minimal basis, but it's, it's, it's a good step. Right. Okay. I just wanted to see where we were at with it, how we were feeling about it. Um, so if you are listening to this later and you are contributing to uh, any CircuitPython libraries or well, with CircuitPython, it'll just be automatic. But if you're contributing to any CircuitPython libraries, please uh, ping one of us or let us know in Discord um, that you want to or are participating in Hacktoberfest and we will get, um, if we approve it, we'll get the label added so that um, you get credit for it. And that's uh, all I have for that. All right. Thank you, Katni. And with that, uh, we'll go to our next item, which is Stu. Hello, Stu. 
guys. Um, yeah, so I just kind of jumped in here because I went to uh, Barnes & Noble yesterday and I picked up a Make magazine that um, was talking about Python boards, and I've been following Python boards for a while. It seems like, um, at least with Adafruit, it kind of exploded. And um, the background on me is that I've made a, um, a completely custom blockchain protocol using Python completely, which has um, its own sub-sect like, of Python that we just call contracting. So you can build smart contracts with Python if you want to look in the internals of how it works. It's pretty straightforward. And our whole idea is that um, a lot of people want to use this technology, but when they start getting into the weeds of it, it's very, they bog you down with a lot of jargon. And a lot of that jargon is for traders to kind of hype it up. And I think that it gets rid of the fun of it. And so this project was supposed to be develop a blockchain that people can use and um, they can make an app or whatever. And another feature of it is that all the transaction fees go back to that smart contract developer itself. Uh, and so you can make an app, monetize it really easily. And so when I picked up this make thing, um, I was like, oh, wow. Cause I looked at circuit Python for actually that subsector of Python as like a core doing all the operations. And I figured I'd just jump in and say, hey, what what kind of, if people are interested in blockchain uh, and especially in Python, I certainly could be a resource. Or if um, people are kind of interested in, oh, how would IoT blockchain work? That's a, that's a huge area that I think is completely, who knows, right? Um, so, yeah, just completely open. I just wanted to kind of pop in and say, hey, um, and see what's going on here. And you guys are just having a meeting at the same exact time that I jumped in. So mm -hmm. here I am. Well, welcome. Thanks. I think this is a good platform to get the word out uh, and let people know uh, that you're a resource. I think I would be curious to see if your Python code could run on any of our devices because they tend to be quite small, RAM-wise. Yeah, um, it totally could not. I'll be honest, it won't be able to, but you could, in theory, pop out the execution core, keep the networking layer, and um, kind of write sort of the internals in CircuitPython, or you could just use it as some sort of beacon to trigger a smart contract, and then, um, I would just have to write a specific circuit Python library, but as long as there's internet connection to that device, it could just execute some sort of smart contract function. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know much about it myself, uh, but we are getting with the ESP32 S2, we are starting to do network connectivity stuff. Yeah, yeah. So completely open ended. I just wanted to jump in and say, hey, um, and I, I have no agenda. That's, I just wanted to say, hi. Cool. Well, thank you. And yeah, it's good to meet you. Like uh, Scott said, one, a couple of things I would add is uh, we have this thing called the community bundle. So when community members write something that works with CircuitPython, you can request that it be added to that. And uh, I think there are a few other requirements on it, but that is a good way to increase visibility of what you're working on. And then, of course, um, our weekly newsletter, if you've got something that is showable, something that's a tweet, something that's a GitHub project, if it's appropriate for Python on hardware, uh, we'll often be able to feature it there. So, um, cool. yeah, I know nothing about blockchain. I know that people have been talking about it for a long time. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, yeah, and nothing has happened, right? <laughs> that's kind of what I'm trying to fix because it's cool. It just is so hard for people to get into it besides just kind of speculation, which I think is crap. Yeah, for sure. Uh, any other remarks on blockchain? All right, well then, um, I have one last item from David Cloud, who is text only, so I will read it off. Uh, he writes, is it possible to talk to the spy chip soldered on Cutie Pie while using the non Hexpress firmware? maybe for storage or data logging? And I think the answer is yes, because um, it's connected by spy pins. 
and uses the spy protocol. However, those pins may be marked as ignore, so they won't appear in the microcontroller module. So the first thing I would do is make sure that those are available to refer to. And then there is a spy protocol for talking to the chips, but it is different than talking to, say, an SD card. So there's probably code to be written to do that. Doesn't look like David's mic is working. Uh, yeah, he said that he was text only. Oh. So, um, oh, are you trying to talk? <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, so I the, hadn't noticed but, he'd unmuted. Go ahead. Well, the low level protocol for spy flashes is pretty straightforward. Um, you basically have to just, you can erase four kilobyte sectors and you can write uh, into that four kilobytes. Um, no, you don't have to do it in C. Like basically, if you're just talking spy to the chip, like CircuitPython will just have no idea what's going on. Um, so you could just implement it all in Python and just work, talk to the flash in terms of just blocks. Um, I don't know. I don't know if you want to get to the file system level in Python because the file system stuff is complicated. Um, well, there's Kevin... actually not a whole lot that you have to do for the file system layer um, in that if you look at Adafruit SD card, the number of methods that it has to implement are pretty small. You've got read, write, and capacity. I think the main complication comes if the erase size is different than the 512 bytes of the fat sector size. You'd have to read off all 4096 bytes modify right. the middle bytes and write it back out. But the actual size of the API is pretty small and you can look at Adafruit SD card uh, Python module to kind of see what that entails. Right, but I'd also assume that you're not doing that because if you're doing that, you might as well just have it configured as your flash. <laughs> well, yeah, the reason to not do it would be it would be a different area of storage that would be writable from CircuitPython, which, uh, could have an, right, but, an advantage. But you could also just remount it as writable. Yeah. Um, it's not going to allow you to like share it with CircuitPython uh, by doing some of it manually. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you want to experiment with just inter interfacing with those chips at the low level, there's no reason you can't just do it uh, with Spy uh, from Python. And Kevin Thomas asks, we could use the register live, I assume. I, I don't think you need the register library. I think you're because the register like the spy flash doesn't really have registers. It has one status register. Um, but besides that, you're actually sending more like commands. You're saying like, now I'm going to erase this sector and here's the address of the sector or here's the I'm going to make a I'm going to write a page and here's the page that I'm going to write. Um, actually, you know, if you want a resource, you could just look at the internal code that does it for what the commands are. Yeah, the internal yep. code is a little little bit complicated because it caters to all different kinds of chips. So yeah. they each have different ways of working, whereas you'll work with a specific chip and you won't uh, probably write code that accommodates all the chips. Right. Uh, but yeah, you could do things like um, if you're doing data logging and you want to do it like higher speed, you could, for example, just erase the entire flash and then write it. Um, because the erase is what takes a while. The programming is relatively fast um, compared to the erase. Yeah, makes me feel like you're you're getting into like database design where they just want like raw level block level access. Yeah, I'll be interesting to see what David comes up with. But uh, that is our last in the weeds topic. So I will move us to wrap up. Thanks everyone for a lot of meaty discussion. Uh, let's see, wrap up. So this has been the CircuitPython weekly meeting for October 13th, 2020. Thank you to everyone who joined us today. If you want to support Adafruit, if you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, and those of us who work on CircuitPython, consider purchasing from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. 
The video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit, and the podcast will be available on major podcast services. It will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. Visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe. The next meeting will be held as usual on Monday at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. The meeting is held on the Adafruit Discord, which you can join by going to adafru.it slash discord. To speak in the meeting and to be notified about the meeting and any changes of time or day, please ask us to add you to the CircuitPythonistas role on Discord. We hope to see you next week. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone.